So why don't we kind of start at the top? You know, you've been in the cybersecurity space for years, perhaps uh, as long or, or longer than myself. You've written many books in um, the, the many years around security. You've always kind of had a particular bet around what you call the data-driven defense. Um, and, and when we kind of talk about security intelligence, like what, what does that mean to you as, as an expert in this space? Yeah, you know, so... Uh, you know, you hear a lot about what security intelligence is from different people. And sometimes I think it's so poorly done. I call it security unintelligence. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think the idea, if you have somebody within your organization that does security intelligence, it is what are the most likely threats that are going to yeah. hit our organization? And, and what I find out is that uh, most places, security intelligence is kind of this, they look out in the world and they read reports and it's all these cool attacks and things. And it's kind of like they're reporting to the organization, this national Enquirer list of really exciting, sexy attacks and stuff. But are yeah. these attacks likely to hit the specific organization they're working for? No. Sure. You know, I, I remember, uh, you know, both you and I are ex Microsoft alums, uh, but I, I was starting to understand at the time. So this is, I'm dating myself, but probably, 10, 15 years ago, uh, I was seeing across all my customers, I was consulting for dozens to hundreds of customers in Microsoft, uh, and I was starting to see that unpatched Java was just this huge yeah. problem. And yeah. I went to I went to our own internal security intelligence guy, super smart guy at Microsoft. We had hired him because he was like the doctorate of security intelligence. And I went, hey, what is the number one way that most Microsoft people and devices are compromised? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I said, I think it's probably unpatched Java. And yeah. he said, I think so too, but we don't have the metrics. And it was just, I was like, oh my God. And so yeah. I think at least I was partly part of what Microsoft did, started to look into it. And when they got through, it was, it was hugely yeah. unpatched Java. Uh, yeah. But that's where I kind of found it. People didn't, you know, organizations, even with the best of intentions, didn't understand. So that's my definition of security intelligence is, understanding whatever your role is, role is. If it's in an organization, how is my company most likely to be successfully attacked next? How are we being likely attacked successfully right now? What are we most likely to be successfully attacked in the near future? And if you're doing it for you know, Microsoft or Semantic or something like that, you're doing it globally or nationally. But sure. certainly security intelligence to me is, what are my most likely threats? Yeah, and, and I know, you know we often uh, work with customers where they can't even uh, articulate what they're trying to protect against, like what type of threat actors. Is it the external rogue uh, adversary? Is it you know, rogue administrators? That, that a lot of time they, they can't even articulate something. And it seems like that kind of ties back to your, your data-driven approach, right? Of, of not just picking things out of the air, but being able to define what are we worried about and, and what are those uh, compromises or, or security issues that are relevant to us or, or that we want to address, right? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's kind of like actuaries and, and, you know, insurance industry. They have a really good idea of how you're likely to be injured in your life. Like they have these yeah. statistics like you're most, you know, you're far more likely to die in your tub at home or falling off a ladder at home than you are in, let's say, an airplane accident or a shark attack or something like that. And I was kind of amazed that in the computer security world that that we really didn't know. Like I would for 20 years, I every time I went to a corporation and I talked to the IT security teams and the CISOs, I'd go, hey, how are you most likely to be attacked? They never had the answer. I mean, sometimes somebody would give me the right answer, which it really it more from unpatched job at social engineering during the 20 years I was doing it. Uh, it actually moved from. Uh, um, uh, boot sector viruses, right? That yeah. I started to see a lot in the, the late 80s and email worms and so on. But I was surprised that, like, if I went to an IT security team and said, hey, how are you most likely to be attacked successfully? If they couldn't give me the right answer, how would the organization be able to appropriately, efficiently focus on the right threats? I was like, yeah. oh my God, it's inefficiencies abound. I certainly, you know, and, you know, a lot of people will like blame whether the, the president or the CEO or the CISO, he's not giving me the right resources. Well, if you're not communicating to senior management what the right problems are, how can they give you the right resources? You know, how can you put the right resource in the right place against the right threats in the right amounts? You can't. Yeah. So, so, so 
how do you approach this this data driven approach? So when an organization you're sitting down with them and you start talking through it, and you can clearly see that they, they don't have a really focused approach to their their security intelligence or, or how they're addressing risks in their environment. How, how do you explain what they should be doing from a data driven approach? Yeah, well, for these days it's it's pretty clear uh, they're the top two reasons why almost any organization is compromised: unpatched software and social engineering. Social engineering is involved in about seventy to ninety percent of attacks. Unpatched software in about twenty to forty percent of attacks. The third thing, let me say, that's been the case since the beginning of computers. Yep. Uh, yeah. The third thing has changed over time. It used to be boot viruses and this and that. These days, because of ransomware, it's password guessing and yeah. password hash crack attacks and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But, you know, so I usually start by saying, okay, that's what it is for most people, but you need to figure out what it is for your organization. How do you do it? Well, it, you know, find out how something broke in. What's the root cause exploit? How did the badness, how did the malware or hacker get in? Every time you come across it, ask the question, how yeah. did it get in? So is it yeah. social engineering, unpatched software, password issues, authentication issues, eavesdropping, misconfiguration, insider threat, physical attack? So I came up with this list of 10 or 12 ways that I started tracking over 22 years now of how things break in. And ask yourself, every time a system has a virus, a worm, or a trojan, or a hacker gets in, yeah. how did they get in? Because I liken it to you have a house, and you've got this house that, that thieves are breaking into all the time. And if you want to stop them from breaking into your house, you have to ask yourself, well, how are they getting in the house? Is it through the front yeah. door? Is it through the back doors, through the windows, to the floor, to the roof, from the ceiling? Like if you don't start to figure out how they're yeah. getting in and then put yeah. in mitigations to stop them, they're going to keep yeah. getting in your house and they're still different yeah. things. And it's the same thing. Like ransomware is a big threat these days. And I'm like ransomware is not your biggest threat. Ransomware is the outcome of your biggest threat. The, yeah. the, Ransomware is an outcome, not a, it, it's how did the ransomware get into the organization in the first exactly. place? Because yeah, exactly. if I made ransomware, if I could snap my fingers and ransomware went away today, well, they're just going, the attacker, if he can use the same use hole, else. it's just going to drop off a backdoor Trojan or password stealing Trojan yeah. or something like yeah. that. So, yeah. you know, that, that's what I, the biggest thing about data-driven defense is try to recognize how things are breaking in and concentrating, closing down those avenues of attack. And, and, and what, why is that, you know, more important to organizations today? You know, certainly security hasn't been something that's been, you know, uh, suddenly new, and it's been here for a long time, but it seems like there's probably a greater emphasis for organizations to be thinking about, you know, the, the, the security intelligence and, and, and how they're approaching risks and, and what they want to mitigate. Like, why is it more important now? Well, you know, certainly it's important because you know, ransomware and stuff is really devastating the world economy, right? They're stealing billions and it's increasing the cost and it's shutting companies. Some, co you know, a lot of companies that get hit by ransomware, they don't recover for a year. I mean, they're still a year later trying to get systems yeah. back up. But, you know, the reason why it's important to understand kind of that, what I call the data-driven nature is that you ultimately understand that firewalls and VPNs and antivirus software doesn't really work because almost every organization has those things. Is there a company hit by ransomware that didn't have up-to-date antivirus and VPNs and firewalls? No, most of them did have that. But what they didn't have is the focused approach of, hey, like if I was, a, you know, I go around telling CIOs and CEOs, CISOs that, hey, two or three things are 99% of the risk. And if you don't focus better on those three things, you're probably yeah. not going to keep hackers and malware out. And if yeah. you do a much better job at just three things, yeah. you're far more likely to keep them out. Well, you know, you're able to focus the resource, get everybody rowing in the canoe in the same direction. Because right now, every paddler is going in a different direction, and people are wondering why the canoe is not going forward as fast, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you know it, it's it's interesting. One of the the things we've advocated um, to, to customers is is around this idea of like moving um, the most affected and devastating accounts onto stronger security. So we think about the network administrator accounts, enterprise admins, domain admins. Um, and, you know, PKI's got some interesting things around smart cards and, and you know, strong authentication. And there's often resistance to hey, we can't really support smart cards through the organization. And we often talk about, well, why don't you take your, your most uh, privileged accounts, your, your enterprise admins, 
and move those to smart cards or, or something that has stronger authentication so they can't be socially engineered, they can't be taken away. Is that kind of an example of, of you know, focusing on one or two specific problems, even though it's not going to address every specific security one? Is, is that kind of a data-driven approach? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly part of it. And let me say, although uh, although I think it's great to focus on uh, enterprise admins, schema admins, that sort of stuff, I also say application admins, right? Like yeah. if you're running Salesforce, you, you know, they're ultimately trying to get at data most of the time. And so it's good these days to make sure you protect your, uh, your application admins as well. But you, you're ready for yeah. a funny thing. And let me say, you and I know that I'm a big PKI guy. I love it. I believe PKI. I believe in PKI. I love the beauty of PKI uh, when it's managed appropriately. Uh, yeah. But like these days, I talk a lot about things like there's a lot of easily fishable MFA. 90, 95% of multi-factor authentication out there is yeah. easily fishable. And people will go, uh, people are shocked, right? I'm like, hey, yeah. if you get a six digit code, that's easily fishable and things like that. But they're yeah. like, well, what is the stuff that's not easily fishable? You know, one of the things, smart cards. Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. a lot of people, a lot of people are saying, oh, I need to go to something new and sexy. Smart yeah. cards right. are actually a fairly secure yeah. multi-factor authentication solution that is not easily yeah. fished. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I, I often kind of say, you know, if you've got a smart card in, in your wallet or you've got a, a thumb drive, we're kind of talking, you know, Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible, dropping through the ceiling while you sleep and stealing things out of your wallet kind of, of, of phishing. But you you, you recently uh, wrote a, a book or a paper on you know, breaking MFA, right? Wasn't yeah, actually, I, I've written a book uh, called Hacking Multi-Factor Authentication, and I write in my LinkedIn. I pro I've probably have written... I've written 1,300 articles, 1,200 articles now, over 1,200 articles, but probably 100 of them on multi-factor authentication over yeah. the years. And it's really something I'm talking, but it's kind of funny that like as people are like, well, what can I use if you can hack all this <laughs> MFA? I'm like, you know, the stuff that worked for 30 years without yeah. a question. And people yeah. are like, well, you have some people, oh, it has the support cost or blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Why move to MFA? Like, if you're going to move your organization from login name and password to a more secure solution, it's disruption. It's it's increased support costs. Blah 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 blah. If it actually isn't much better than passwords, what mm -hmm. have you gained? Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and, and those legacy legacy solutions like smart cards really do work. Well. There's a reason why the U.S. military is still using CAC cards. Yeah. 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 And I, I certainly understand, you know, it's, it's difficult to deploy 5,000, 10,000, you know, smart cards to, to every level of employee, but start with your, your most privileged accounts, your application ones. Um, and, and, you know, that's an interesting thing. A lot of SaaS services, the most that they'll offer is some type of phone-based MFA or, or something like that. There really isn't a, a lot of great options, and you bring up a great point around, you know, application admins. That's not just on-prem. That's... SaaS services that, that you're dealing with in the cloud. Um, on the topic of kind of the, the data-driven approach, do you, do you have any great success stories of, of customers you've been able to, to work with where maybe you went in and they were kind of doing a haphazard approach to security and you kind of talk some sense in? Like, what, what is that before and after look yeah, like? You know, I... I'm in a weird place. The the my my the, I've written 13 books, but the data driven data driven computer defense book has sold something like 40,000 copies now. Uh, but I have admins come to me all the time saying, "Listen, we really like it's an epiphany. Like when you read the book and I talk about how to approach it, a light bulb goes off because I'm I'm literally saying, "Hey, you should concentrate on the ways that you're most likely to be exploited." Like it's the most simple sentence anybody could say in the entire world. But I do have a lot of people tell me that they went from being attacked all the time to being less attacked or even not having any attacks. I have yeah. uh, CISOs and people that are new CISOs saying it has changed the way that they do computer security. And that does, wow. I got to tell you, it, it does make me feel better in my heart that I'm helping people. <laughs> it, you know, it's like yeah. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says, you know, buy low and sell high, but it's a lot harder yeah. to do that in the practice. So what I, I hope that I do is that I, that I wake people up and and they say ah you know yeah that makes sense and not only that but it's not that hard to, like people will how could i possibly know what's the most likely way that my company could be attacked well if yeah. you have no clue listen to me and everybody else it's social engineering and unpatched yeah. software and password issues you All know, right. so, like, so if somebody 
if, if somebody is, is, is watching this and, and they really don't know where to start, those are the three, right? Yeah, this, yeah, yeah. This, by far, this, by far. I mean, you yeah. it, you would be the odd organization where those aren't the things. You'd be some super lockdown military not connected to the internet where yeah. social engineering maybe is not a, a big, but not only that, but I say you can like, it, it's really easy to do. Like if your company has an antivirus report, you know, most companies have some antivirus product and you get this report that goes, here's the malware that we detected. Yeah. Like literally, if you get the list of the top 10 things that it detected in any given month or quarter, you can go look those things up in the internet and see how they spread. And you'll yeah. see most of them spread via social engineering. They'll literally tell you this virus, this family spreads this way. And it's one or two things, usually mostly yeah. one thing. Sometimes, oh, through web servers or unpatch this and use this vulnerability. But literally in 30 minutes, you can see how your organization is getting hit by malware. And then yeah. then start to focus and say, OK, if, you know, 60 percent of this stuff is from social engineering, maybe I should, you know, it's amazing. The average company probably spends, uh, you know, five less than five percent of their of their budget to fight the 99 percent of the risk. Yeah, and it's just it's yeah. just crazy. You know, yeah, it's a uh, you know, and it's it's there in your face. I think it really just takes communicating and refocusing mm -hmm. people's, uh, you know, people's uh understanding about how to defend yourself. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think what I really like about this approach is we, we talk a lot about kind of visibility of, of, of what those attacks are. No, th there may be information in existing systems and firewalls and uh, VPN routers, your, your uh, DNS providers that, that can kind of show you where um, historical attacks that have come into the environment, even if you haven't looked and you haven't paid attention. No, we're a big, proponent of this concept of, of, of visibility of if you don't go out and find the data, you're not going to be able to make these, these informed decisions. And then you've got kind of a great, you no know, generic list, but organizations, if they had that data, if they were able to get the visibility of, hey, here's what's actually happening in my environment. Uh, and I assume it's it's not just um, a one-time action. It could be, hey, we've, we've addressed these things, but we need ongoing visibility because if we address unpatched software and we you know social engineering, we, we've addressed those, you can't just let your guard down and say, hey, we're data driven, we're done. It's okay, we need to have visibility of what's happening and then find our next three, right? It's 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 an mm -hmm. ongoing exercise, right? Yeah, not only that, but when you're measuring it, um, if you're doing it effectively over time, you're seeing trends. You know, yeah. like maybe back in the day, you'd say, okay, you'd see email worms or viruses are dying, but USB key threats are coming up. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, watch the trends. You're like, okay, second month, yeah. third month, these trends are yeah. coming up or password attacks, you know, are coming up. We're starting to see, we're starting to see a lot of attacks against RDP. You yeah. know, it's good to pay attention to increasing trends and saying when you see other things decrease and you're like, well, that particular popularity thing's dying, or I'm doing a more effective, you know, job at mitigating that particular yeah. threat. So by monitoring an ongoing way, seeing trends allows you to have early, res quicker response. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting, though. We, we both have kind of a, a soft spot for, for PKI. And um, what I, I find difficult about it is, is that visibility aspect, right? You know, we, we've got a few common set of core servers. We issue things out there. Um, a lot of times customers will say, how will I know if revocation checking is happening? How do I know if an adversary has changed something? I go, you really can't. It's, it's not designed for that. Um, you're going to have to find other ways to look for that data. So I, I think organizations need to figure out where do they want to focus, find the data or the empirical evidence that helps them figure out what their threats are and then find a way to mitigate it. So from the, the, the intelligence side, do you find like this um, concept of identifying these? Are, are these kind of a foundational thing that an organization should figure out what these security intelligence focuses are through a data-driven approach? And then that defines everything downstream, what solutions they're employing, where they're yes. staffing, where they're budgeting, that that's kind of like the foundation, like the starting point. And if they haven't done that, maybe you need to pause go through that exercise and figure out if you need to, yeah, to refocus. It, it, it should drive everything. Uh, yeah. You know, even I, I, just to give you kind of a neat example is, let's say the training newsletters that a lot of companies send out. So most companies today would say, yes, I know social engineering is the biggest problem. Unpatched software is certainly a big problem. Well, they'll put out this like newsletter to teach people about it. And, like, and they'll put, they'll put 
uh, social engineering. Oh, this is a big deal. You got to watch out for phishing emails. And then the next month, they put a different topic. And then a month <laughs> after that, a different topic. And I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. If you're doing it right and you're focused right, your newsletter is constantly talking about those top two or three issues again and again and again. Like I'm amazed at how many will they'll they'll switch out to some weird attack that happened to some weird like again, like it's National <laughs> Enquirer. And, it, and yeah. people read it, oh my God, this is incredible. They had an NFT cryptocurrency attack yeah. from cross from a cross bridge attack. Does it apply yeah. to my company? No, but they put it in the newsletter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so well, yeah, it you, it should drive everything budgets yeah. accountability metrics yeah. everything um would organizations maybe have a different term for this so we're, we're kind of calling it security intelligence uh if somebody was uh in their organization maybe they're new to the role new to the organization or maybe they've been there for a while and they're wondering have we gone through this like what might be some other terms that the organization calls this kind of stuff security posture uh i threat mean threat intelli i mean threat intelligence is one part of it these yeah. days the term would be resiliency you know of some sort i think is a big term i see in there uh but th that's a that's a great question um you know what are they calling it it you know it's, it really should be it security <laughs> yeah. you know or it security life cycle management or something like yeah. that but and, and a, a lot of the, like your top three examples are very kind of external adversary driven. You know, some it doesn't necessarily have to be a nation state, you know, script kitty, remote hacker, you know, wh whatever it is, not necessarily internal. Is, is there a equivalent set of, of data driven approaches or, or top ones that you would um, address from a internal risk perspective? Yeah, I mean, so that, you know, insider threat, it, so from the global scheme of things, and you have these 10 or 12 ways that people break in, one of them is insider threat. Yeah. And I, I think that insider threats do occur. They're a smaller number compared to social engineering. But, you know, what's interesting about if you look at some of the best, uh, latest information on insider threat, mm -hmm. and people say it's always very difficult to detect, they're actually statistically, you can kind of figure out if you're increasing or decreasing the risk of an insider threat. Uh, yeah. that it's really some great, great stuff coming out of, um, I guess, well, what are they, Carnegie Mellon. If you want if you want stuff an insider threat, Carnegie yeah. Mellon has the best stuff. But they actually show that you, can t you have these happy employees, and here's the traits of a happy employee and a disgruntled employee, and here's the traits of the organizations that let this goodwill languish in their employees yeah. and how they turn. So they actually interviewed all kinds of insider employees and kind of found out here's the traits that they didn't – like one is that my, and Microsoft's on the front edge of it as well, but they found out – now, if the employee doesn't interact with other employees a whole lot, so they're alone, and these days with work from home, that's more yeah. often. But that's yeah. actually one of the biggest traits using data. They found yep. out one of the biggest traits was someone working alone. Then if they're feeling isolated, if they're not feeling like the company uh, invests in them, if they have a feeling of corporate, uh, what was the, I forget the term, but they don't feel like the it has, that there's injustice, that they don't yep. feel that they're being treated fair and equitable. So mm -hmm. it's kind of neat from an insider threat thing. If you look at the data, they literally say, here's the four things your company should try to do to make it less likely that someone's going to go rogue, you yeah. know, yeah. and you, and you'll never, like, I, I, you know, to this day, when I was a VP of IT, I had this uh, woman, I asked her, she worked for me and she was really smart. I liked her. And I said, what do you want to be? And I forget what she was. She was a systems analyst. She goes, I want to be a DBA. So I spent tons of money teaching her, uh, sending her classes to be a SQL DBA, sent her to all kinds of classes. I tripled her salary. And then towards the end of my time there, I found that she was actually stealing credit cards uh, <laughs> from the databases she was monitoring and buying Dell and network yeah. equipment, having it shipped to her house and we had to fire her. She wasn't that, apparently not smart enough to hide it. Uh, yeah. But I, to this day, I'm like, wow, I, I'm like, I was so invested in her. So, so sometimes the data yeah. may say Sorry. one thing and then you just yeah. come across this aberrant example. It's, yeah. it's not a reason to throw out the data, you know, yeah. you, if you're trying to decrease risk, you have to be like an insurance actuary. You have to, okay, what are the odds? Well, if I want to decrease my insurance costs, I'm going to tell the automobile industry that they should have anti-skid brakes and they should have, you know, require seatbelts and we should have the little detectors on the side, you know, yeah. wondering when there's someone coming up on the side of them. That, that's what we need to do in computer security. Look at the data of how you're most likely to be compromised internally, externally, whatever, 
and then work at focusing on those solutions. These, this gut, the days of gut filling, you know, mm -hmm. should, uh, that's great. You can have a gut filling, back it up with data. Yeah. No, one of the things that we've been um, focusing on a lot lately with uh, PKI Spotlight is this concept of security posture management, where you, know, you, you need to define your posture. You know, what, what do we want to protect against? Social engineering, unsigned code, uh, but it could be firewall settings, VPN settings, Wi-Fi settings, but it's not enough to, to do it as a one-time activity. So I, I would imagine that part of, of your approach to security intelligence is kind of an ongoing, you know, like what is the visibility? Is that system or process you put in place, not just is it effective, but is it configured and operating and, and preventing the attacks you're expecting, right? It's not yeah, a set. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, you're exactly right. And the PKA Spotlight, to me, is closed a blind spot that we've always had in the PKI industry. One of the problems with PKI is if you install it and it's working well, it yep. becomes almost invisible, like background noise. And yep. then when things start to break, there's no visibility. So I love PKI yep. Spotlight and the idea that, hey, let us be your heartbeat checker. Yep. <laughs> tell, yeah. you know, yeah. tell us what's important to you. You're obviously figuring out what you think are the indicators of a healthy and unhealthy PKI. And that yep. way they don't have to aggressively be monitoring it all the time or God, God forbid. Yep. And again, love Microsoft, but... Yep. It seemed to me that the inter like Microsoft is full of enterprise tools, but they uh -huh. just didn't do it on PKI. Like, yeah. like they must have fired those guys or something, <laughs> uh, because there isn't an enterprise yeah. PKI person that I know that doesn't want better management yeah. of those software yeah. tools. And, and, it, and that concept really works across platforms. Like when we kind of think about security posture and managing it, you no, know, your, your firewalls need visibility and, and making sure that they do stay configured the way you're expecting. So, you know, if you go through this security intelligence side, you say, here's my concerns, and you go out and you buy all these nifty things, this firewall, that thing, whether it's PKI Spotlight, whatever it is, but you still need to have that ongoing diligence to say, is this stuff operating? Is it turned on? Is it, you know, did somebody accidentally turn it off? Did something not get covered from a cloud perspective? We still see those where people have gone out and bought some really cool tools, but they forgot to include certain servers or they forgot to include certain ports and, and it's not really working that I imagine part of this is, is not just set it up and, you know, make sure you renew the license every year. It's, it's due diligence. It's, it's ongoing awareness around this. Um, you know, are, are, are there areas that, that you would say there are particular blind spots for organizations? You've talked about what those top threats are, but like what, what, what do organizations struggle the most when they're trying to come to terms with their security intelligence of, of things they just don't know? Is it simply knowing what is attacking them currently or is, is it something else? Yeah, I, I mean, overall, the idea is they don't focus on the right things enough. They don't, sometimes they don't know to look. Uh, I mean, and then of course, some of the central, you know, inventory, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, if you don't know, what your inventory is, your software, your hardware, your data. You know, that's the joke, you know, uh, you need, we're here to protect data, but most yeah. organizations really don't have a good idea where their data is. And yeah. if you don't have that, how can you protect it? So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's amazing how crucial having a good inventory is. Yeah. You know, it, yeah, what, what they have and where they are. Yeah. 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 I mean, without that, you know, you almost don't have any start. And the joke is, I've had people tell me, oh, I know where all my data is. I'm like, well, that guy's clueless. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, the answer is not that easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the data you think you know about. Um, yeah. No, it, it, if we had to kind of go to a happy note, you know, compared to say five years ago, what are organizations doing better now? Like, like what, what are they getting right uh, in the security space that maybe they weren't doing so well five years ago? Uh, I got to tell you, that's a tough one, Mark. Um, I've been doing this 32 years and it seems yeah. pretty bad and pretty broken. Yeah. Um, I would say this, that I, I, I think that we have more information than ever before. Uh, you have more tools. You have the opportunity to make a better defense yeah. uh, than, you know, years ago. Let's say like PKI. Up until you did PKI Spotlight, all, the best you had is PKI View. <laughs> Yeah, and and some and some scripts or macros that somebody yeah. that didn't really understand PKI well wrote. So yeah. I think we, you know, the 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 probably if I say positive things, there's better tooling today and better tools yeah. that you can buy 
that will do a better job than some guy you're asking to write scripts, but you have to take advantage of them, you know, and yeah. you ha- so you have to have the right focus. You have, you know, I think, you know, I love the terms, the cyber hygiene, you know, where people are trying to get, and people are starting to be able to run yeah. tools and figure out things. It, it's, you know, it's probably, you, you know, like let's say your password or, or inactive accounts are probably monitored better than they used two years ago. But unfortunately, a lot of the same, uh, because people are so distracted uh-huh. by looking at too many things and, and trying to do too many things, uh, that there's a lot of things that really, if you look at the data, don't have a lot of impact upon your risk yeah. and they get distracted and that allows yeah. the attacker to then break in. Um, yeah. that, that's what, but I'd say the opportunity to do better monitoring and do better focus, those tools are more there than ever before if you if yeah. you take advantage of them. Yeah, um, th- there's an interesting concept that um, Gartner Research has that they, they put out their 2022 Identity and Access Management uh, Guide. And, and it's a, essentially an, an interesting shift. Um, over the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of customers that kind of wanted to consolidate and own everything they were doing from microservices to on-prem and now there's SaaS and cloud and it's a very disparate uh, approach and uh, Gartner kind of uh, talks about this concept of a cybersecurity mesh architecture and it's, it, it really is kind of dominated around this idea of use the best in class solution if, if you need a security solution that does really well in the cloud use that if you need something that's providing really good firewalls on-prem use it but you need to have kind of that single pane of, of glass you need some way of having compliance that um we, we're we're kind of in that hybrid world now right where it's it's on-prem it's private tenant cloud it's it's public cloud it's it's internet uh and a whole combination of things so um i i, I imagine having you know single pane of glass view across the security products is, is interesting. Um, do you think, you know, being in this mesh architecture, this hybrid world is going to um, pose new security threats that you know, challenge what people are used to seeing today? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just, you know, it increases the complexity and you've got to have the tools that can do, you know, have that single paint, pane of glass that can look into different types of products. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, it, it increases the complexity, but interesting even in complexity, like people will say, well, how are most cloud products compromised? I can tell you, it's uh, social engineering. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same thing, right? The password that got on. Yeah, yeah it's social engineering, unpatched software and password issues. Yeah. And uh, the, only, the only thing where I, I tend to kind of is like, okay, you want to fight password issues? Well, then you're going to be going to probably some multi-factor authentication solution. Make sure you choose one that's not easily fishable. Yeah. You know, like the problem is, is that people, OK, I want to get MFA and it's like a checklist. I've got MFA. And the, let me say the insurance people are like, do you have MFA? Yes. Yeah. They don't ask you what type, whether it's easily fishable or not. They're like oh, MFA yeah. check mark. Yeah. And you can you can. And when you go to buy MFA, buy a, a less fishable form. Well, they're, they're saying that's, just, you know, that. Yeah. There's small, there's small little points that, you know, if you could direct people in the right direction might lead to a yeah. better security risk outcome. Yeah, and I love the MFA side. Um, you know, we, we, we talk to customers about that all the time. So uh, here's a random question for you. Would you ever advise a customer to leave a particular solution simply because the only thing it offered was an SMS uh, MFA? No, it, 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 is that permissible if there's no other options or is it given option A, option B, they're both the same, but one has a better MFA? Is that the, is that the decision maker for you? Maybe, uh, you know, a common question I get asked is, should they be on SMS-based MFA, you know, yeah. versus passwords? Like, isn't it better to be an SMS? And my answer is, not, not. it's not a clear thing. I I, I was talking to a, uh, this has been a couple of months ago, but I was talking to a, a, a CISO of a large credit union organization, think large bank, but it's credit union. Yeah. And he said they've been compromised more since switching over to SMS-based MFA than they yeah. were on passwords. And he wished they would go back to passwords for the customers. Oh, geez, geez. And I, uh, you know, I was like, that message. I was like, can I? Can we share this publicly? He's like, nah, I don't want to put my name behind it. But that, and let me say, the U.S. government has been saying don't use SMS-based MFA uh, yeah. since 2017 officially. Wow. They've been saying it longer yeah. than that, but if it, so it's five years, the U S government has been saying not to use SMS based MFA. Do you think the U S government is on the cutting edge of cybersecurity? Probably no. not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, meh. 
something to be yeah. said. So um, I, I know you wrote the the MFA book a while ago, a um, couple of years ago. With, without giving away all of the, the guts and glory, is, is there a favorite hack that that you wrote about in the in the MFA book? Yeah, um, it, it's probably just the one that works against 90, 95% of MFA. And that is, I send you a phishing email. It has, mm -hmm. you know, you think you're going to the right website, but you're really going to a fake website that then directs you to the real website. So it's called yeah. a man in the middle attack. And then everything yeah. you type in uh, goes to it and everything that the, the real website has goes to you, but the man in the middle attacks it. Uh, but let me say my two of my uh, more favorite stories these days, like I, in the book, I'm a fan of push base MFA. And that's where you get the, you know, you get this text going, are you logging in? Yes or no to approve. Yeah. And I was like, okay, push base in, in the book. I say push based MFA is more secure. It has yeah. not proven to be that. And I now write yeah. against it because it turns out about 30% of people using them, uh, push based MFA will answer the prompt to yeah. allow someone to log in, even yeah. when they're not logging in. Yeah, well, I, I know I get that because I don't know if it's like my Outlook on my laptop who is signing in behind the scenes or, or something like that. And, and That's what think, people are like, I must, yeah, yeah exactly. And th so, you know, I, I've talked to some pen testers that say we love when we go into an organization that has push-based MFA. They said because we can just hit everybody and, you know, about 30% of the people are saying yes and we're in. He said it's like yeah. going up to a New York City apartment building, you know, and hitting all the buttons. He goes, somebody's yeah, yeah. always waiting for a pizza guy. Yeah, I, I think I recently read uh, something from the Azure team where they were working on location-based context for the push so that, you know, hey, this is coming from a sign-in that is... No, in another country, clearly not me. I yeah, it's called geo. They have different terms, but geokinetics or geolocation or, you know, the idea like, hey, Roger just logged in from Tampa, Florida. Could he have logged in from Russia an hour later? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And this, this was around the MFA, even where on the push, they would say the request came from an IP that is in this location. Do you want to improve this one? So at least a little more visibility, but it, it, it's... it's uh, uh, difficult. So never uh, under never underestimate humanity's <laughs> ability to ignore any message you send them. Yes. To get well, logged I, in. I remember when you came out with that book and I go, how can you hack SMS? It goes to your phone. So um, that was a really interesting read. Um, what, what's next for you? What, what's the, the next book uh, coming up for, for Roger Grimes? I'm actually probably so I'm probably writing my my first fiction book. And, oh, yeah. and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me say writing fiction is the hardest thing I've ever done. But I've had this story in my head for 10 years and it's got some computer security stuff in it, but it's really more based around human based interests. And uh, I don't know. Uh, and I, I know I have a really good story. Uh, we'll see <laughs> if I can write it. Uh, but, yeah. you know, these days, uh, just professionally, I got two things in mind professionally. One is to push this idea of people paying attention to a better data-driven defense, and mm -hmm. maybe, and also trying to. I'm also strongly pushing that people don't use easily fishable MFA. So trying, yeah. I really, I'm, I am this really being loud about that, and and probably my career goal. And I'm 55. I'm maybe going to be doing this business another 20 years, but my life goal has always been career-wise. Uh, to make the internet a far safer place to compute. And I know how to make the internet safer. We know how to make the internet sa far safer than it is today. The yeah. problems are not technical. We have the protocols, we have the technology. It's convincing people, you know, you can't get people at your dinner table to agree on something. We'll now try to get the whole world to agree on how to secure something. Uh, but that's my goal. And I'm going to measure the success of my career on whether or not I've made, helped make the internet a far safer place to compute. That is my ultimate long term objective career. That, that's that, that's wonderful. You know, it, it certainly is a difficult thing trying to get people out of the mindset of, well, what's the cost if we don't do something? You know, the odds are it won't happen. And if it does, it doesn't cost me very much. And, you know, there's a bigger impact and there, there's an ongoing impact and it encourages more things. So thank you for evangelizing that. Um, I, I'd love to hear when your uh, fiction book comes out. And if there's a love story, I, I think there needs to be some type of broken MFA where the love interests break <laughs> up because somebody accidentally fished it. They were snooping. I, I you, you got to tie it back <laughs> somehow so that people that's can get great. A that's great, Mark. That's great. Yeah, if it's yeah. in there, you, you, you can send me a signed copy. That's right. That's right. Okay. 
Yeah. Well, thanks, Roger. Really appreciate your time and uh, look forward to your future books. Look forward to your future mini writings and publications and uh, appreciate everything that you do out there in the security world for us. Thanks, Mark. And I, I wish much luck and success to PKI Solutions. All right. Thanks, Roger. Take care, everyone.